Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Timberlake. I invite you to stand with us and sing. Yeah. Here we go. Praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. I'll praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm not.
Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are good. God, we know that so many of us have experienced the incredible difference that you make in our lives. That one of the best decisions that we can make is to put you at the center of, of who we are. And that when we do, everything changes. That when you're at the center, our life gets better. Our relationships get better. Our thoughts get better. Our priorities change. And so, God, we thank you for that. For all my friends that are joining us today in the room and online, for those of us who ex have experienced your goodness and those of us who are, who are maybe searching for something today, God, I pray that for all of us that we would leave today encouraged and refreshed and challenged because of your great love for us. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Well, good morning. Welcome to Timberlake once again. I'm so glad that you are here with us. I hope you're having a good weekend. When you came in, you received uh, a program. Inside, there's some helpful things to follow along with the service. There's also a Connect card. If this is one of your first few times at Timberlake or you just wanna get more plugged in, uh, you can fill that card out. There's also a QR code on the back of the seat in front of you, and there's a link in the chat for those of you joining us online as well. Uh, as we head into spring, there's lots of ways for you to get connected. Uh, not only are our spring groups launching this month, uh, but we also have a couple uh, Connect events coming up. Uh, this Saturday, we have a men's breakfast uh, for all the guys. If you are available on Saturday, it's a great time. We just have some food, uh, meet some other guys, uh, time for a connection, a lot of fun for that. And then the following Friday, we have our annual women's event. And so please mark your calendars. These are events that you're not gonna wanna miss if you are in town and able to. There's information in the lobby on both of those. Uh, we're also gonna receive an offering if you would like to invest financially in the mission and ministry here at Timberlake. You can do that through our website, through our app, or there's giving kiosks in the back of the room as well. But not only does your generosity go to all the practical things, uh, the, the keeping the lights on, the food, the coffee. Well, for some of you, coffee is spiritual experience. But uh, at the heart of everything that we do is helping people experience life transformation through uh, Jesus. And that's honestly what your generosity enables. Two weeks ago, we had our Easter experiences, which were just incredible. And uh, I know for many of us, we uh, come to a service, or maybe you're out of town sometimes, you don't always get to see the impact that Jesus is having uh, through this ministry in the region. And so the team put together a recap video of the Easter experience uh, that we want you to check out. So go ahead and have a seat, and then check out the screen. Good morning. I love that video. It's a reminder that we are not alone, that we are a uh, family of churches uh, that are spread out, Castle Rock, Duval, Redmond, and um, it's just, just exciting to be a part of what God's doing. Now, over 30 years ago, in October of 1991, the Andrea Gale, which was a 72-foot long commercial fishing boat, left a port New England and headed for the Atlantic Ocean. It was supposed to be just a regular trip for her, but ended up being her last journey. And the reason why is because when the Andrea Gale was 180 miles away from land, she encountered one of the most powerful forces on planet Earth, a, a full-blown hurricane over the open seas. Now, a hurricane over the ocean is going to be more devastating, more powerful than a hurricane on land. Uh, they released the energy equivalent to 10 atomic bombs every single second. Birds have been known to drown midair, mid-flight, as, as water gets in their nostrils. And so the Andrea Gale had the misfortune of running into a storm that was the result of three separate weather systems coming together. The storm was so powerful, it created waves as tall as 100 feet, uh, created uh, wind uh, that was measured at 75 miles an hour. It was a sustained wind speed. Uh, it was absolutely an apocalyptic type of situation. It created $200 million in damage to coastal towns and homes. As you can imagine, the Andrea Gale never stood a chance, right? All six of the crew members uh, vanished forever. Only a little bit of the uh, debris from the boat was ever recovered. And it's a captivating story. So captivating that six years after these events, a book came out about it called The Perfect Storm. And then a few years after that, a major Hollywood film with George Clooney was produced. 
Storms are captivating because they have immense power and they can do immense destruction. And so last week, what we did is we kicked off just a short two-week teaching series about storms and specifically the storms in our life and how to respond to the scary and unpredictable and turbulent and overwhelming events that can unfold. And if you missed last week, I want to give you a very quick recap. I want to Just give you the three realities of storms that we looked at. One of them is that everyone encounters storms, relationship storms, parenting storms, financial storms, storms of loss, emotional storms, storms connected to our careers, storms connected to our physical health or our uh, uh, emotional health or our mental health. And the thing about storms is we all experience them that nobody gets to choose their specific storm. Sometimes the choices we make result in storms, but we don't get to choose how powerful that storm is, the exact type of storm, and how long it lasts. And then at the end of the day, we, even though we don't get to choose the storms that we go through, we can choose how we respond to those storms. And of course, as human beings, we want to respond in ways that are going to be beneficial. We want to respond with wisdom. We want to respond with maturity. But here's what I found in life, that it doesn't even matter how much we love God doesn't matter how wise we want to be in responding to storms. The reality is we often don't respond in healthy ways. And that's because storms have this ability to impact our emotions. When we're in a season of life where it just feels like everything's come together to conspire against us, it creates the perfect storm for us and and what we're in, in, in what we have to experience. And when that happens, it messes with our emotions. And sometimes it doesn't even matter what your temperament is. Uh, It doesn't matter how, you know, you're strong, your willpower is sometimes uh, storms have the power to uh, make us emotionally numb. We stop caring. we, We check out. We don't feel much. When we become numb to pain or heartbreak, it can feel like a blessing, right? Because we're not feeling much, but in reality, it's dangerous. Uh, There's a very rare uh, condition known as congenital insensitivity to pain and and, uh, anhydrosis. And and people with this condition can't feel pain, which obviously feels in some ways like it would be a superpower. But in reality, it's very dangerous because what happens is people break bones, they get cuts, uh, they don't feel it, they don't sense it, and then they get infection. Uh, It's a very, very dangerous condition. And people who have it would desperately want for some sort of solution, right? To to be found so they can begin to feel. They could step on a rusty nail and not even know it. When we become emotionally numb and we're not feeling uh, uh, the same way we typically would, right? We're not feeling values and convictions the way that we typically would. That's when we tend to make decisions that end up uh, or we end up shipwrecking our lives. So storms impact our emotions. Sometimes we become emotionally numb. Other times we become disproportionately emotional. So so someone criticizes us and we become incredibly defensive or even hostile. And we're prone to these outbursts of anger, rage or frustration. And we're like, "Uh, where did that come from? I didn't even know that I, I was capable of that. Because this isn't about temperament. Sometimes you can be a very boisterous person and and become emotionally numb. And other times uh, you can be, you know, have an emotional outburst. And even very calm people, temperament are just very even keel, can become uh, disproportionately emotional when they're going through a storm. And the scriptures are jam-packed with stories of individuals who went through storms in their life and, and then it affected their emotions. People that we would never imagine that their emotions could ever be affected because they love God so deeply. So when Moses, who was the leader of the Jewish people, when he started experiencing uh, leadership storms, he gets to a point, he's so depleted, he cries out to God with these words. He says, I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. If this God is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Do me a favor and spare me this misery. When the Jewish prophet Jeremiah experienced ongoing storms of rejection and loneliness, it became absolutely too much for him. And he launches into a prayer and he says, God, you're faithful and God, you're great. And and he's saying these great things to God. And then in the middle of the prayer, he says this, yet, yet I curse the day I was born. May no one celebrate the day of my birth. I curse the messenger who told my father, good news, you have a son. This sounds like an overly emotional teenager when you take away their phone. Right? I cursed the day that I was born. I wish I, I wasn't even alive anymore. 
One of the most famous stories in our Bible is the story of a guy named Job. He's a godly man who goes through a series of uh, destructive storms. He loses his health. He loses uh, uh, some of his family members to death. He loses his fortune. And it's a fascinating story because he starts off strong and optimistic and I'm going to be faithful to God and God, you are good to me. And then he just emotionally, it just starts to wear down and, and he gets to the point where he, he says this, I would rather be strangled rather than die, uh, rather die than suffer like this. I hate my life and don't want to go on living. Now we could spend the entire service today talking about the reactions of people in the scriptures who love God and how they responded to storms. The reality is that as the storms of our life grow in duration and they grow in intensity and they grow in destructiveness, our emotions are impacted in a, in a big way. And this is why when we're in the middle of a very powerful storm, it's almost impossible to stay hopeful. Right? We can show up into gatherings in which we sing about the greatness of God and the faithfulness of God. And we can gather in groups in which we talk about the goodness of God and how God gets us through. But it, it's just hard to really feel that and believe that. It's hard to stay hopeful. But I do want you to hear specifically today, if you are in the midst of the storm, that storms can serve a purpose. Every storm can serve a purpose. Now, this doesn't mean we invite storms. This doesn't mean we chase storms. This doesn't mean we try to make decisions that bring storms into our life. So I'm not minimizing the storm that you're going through. What I am saying is that when we experience pain, when we experience suffering, when we experience the fallout of destruction from any type of storm in life, good can come out of it. Now that's a lot easier to hold on to in regards to hope if, if I believe that and I'm able to see it, but often we can't see it. So last week I was on a relatively easy eight mile hike and while I was on this hike, there was this couple that went running past me and they're loaded up with uh, water bottles and all this running gear. And it looks like they had a pack for snacks. I mean, they have it all going on. And, and I just kept walking. And then about an hour later, that same couple comes running by me in the opposite direction now. And it was obvious to me that they're preparing for some sort of race or marathon. And, and the question that went through my mind is what kind of mental disorder does someone have to have to get motivated to do such a thing, <laughs> right? And of course, the answer is that there is an actually an incredible amount of personal gratification uh, in training and then completing a 26.2 mile race. And it doesn't even matter what your finish time is. The fact that you complete it, uh, completed it is, is very rewarding. As humans, we have an ability to embrace pain if we see the payoff on the other side. But if we don't see the payoff and it doesn't make sense and we can't connect the dots, then obviously we run from it at all costs. Now, there are some people who will never run a marathon, but they'll make the choice to go on an international flight and they'll sit still in some small chair for 10 or 15 or 20, 24 hours. Sometimes sandwiched between people they don't even know. Now, why would they allow themselves and put themselves in a situation with prolonged discomfort? Well, the answer is, if you want to explore Thailand or visit South Africa or go to somewhere exotic like Wenatchee, the, the pain of being stuffed in a middle chair for 24 hours might be worth it if on the other end of the discomfort is exploration or adventure or, or relaxation or rest or get to, getting to experience a different culture. Again, we have an ability to endure pain, sometimes even choose to go through pain if there is a payoff and a purpose on the other side. The most obvious illustration of this would be women who go through labor and delivery. Childbirth is one of the most physically demanding and emotionally intense experiences a woman will ever go through, other than marriage. And, and, and some women do this, amen. Uh, some women do this, not just one time, but they'll go through this multiple times. Is it because they want less sleep and more stress in their life? Well, of course not. It's because on the other side of the pain is a child. So we have this ability to embrace suffering if we see a purpose uh, to that suffering or we know what the outcome is going to be. Unfortunately, when the storms of life hit us, often there is no rhyme or reason to what we're going through. And because our emotions are all over the place, it's very difficult in the midst of a storm to believe that there is going to be some sort of payoff on the other side, that some good will come out of this. 
Now, storms in themselves are not good, but good can come out of it. And so the question we just need to pause and consider at some point is this, how can I find purpose in my pain? How can I find purpose in my pain? All throughout the ancient scriptures, we come across the stories of individuals and families who had to endure storms of drama and distress and emotional suffering and just figure out how to get through it. And they had at some point to look back after they got through the storm and try to find good in what they went through. And one of the stories that's recorded for us is in the book of 1 Samuel, and it takes place at a time where Israel was made up of a loose confederation of tribes, all right? The nation of Israel at the time was just kind of adrift. And it's when this story takes place, which this is what I want to anchor in on today. Right at the start of the story, we are introduced to a family, specifically an individual who is experiencing an emotional storm. Uh, The patriarch of the family is a guy named Elkanah, and here's what we read about Elkanah. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah did not. Now, in ancient Jewish culture, polygamy was not forbidden, but it wasn't widely practiced because you had to be fairly wealthy to afford two wives or more, right? And so we assume Elkanah was probably well off. He has two wives, and we learn throughout the story that there is jealousy and tension between them, which surprises me. I can't ever imagine how having sister wives could end up in some sort of drama, but it does, right? And now, now we don't read this in the story, but Jewish tradition tells us that Elkanah and Hannah had been married for 10 years. They were unable to have children. And so Elkanah decides, I want a baby mama. So he goes out, he finds Penina, and uh, he says, I want to continue the family line. And so he marries her uh, with the hopes of having babies. And according to tradition, Penina ends up having 10 children. All right? So you, you've got Han over here. You've got Elkanah. You've got Penina. And then you've got her 10 children. You can imagine how this becomes dysfunctional. Right? You think your family's complicated? Right? This just is next level. And right at the start of the story, we learn that Elkanah is a man who, who deeply loves God. Every year, he just made it a practice to travel from where he was living about 15 miles away uh, to a town named Shiloh. And he would go to the town and he uh, would right away go to the tabernacle, which was a portable place of worship. All right, this is what the Jewish people, before they had a big, beautiful temple, they would worship in while they were in the desert. And it would take an entire day to go to this town uh, traveling. And then it would take an entire day to get back. All right, so there was some commitment involved. And, and every year, Elkanah would go and he'd bring his family. And not only would he bring his family, they would bring an animal to sacrifice. And, and the way it would work is the, the priest would take the animal and would burn it and then take a portion of it as kind of this offering to God, but then take the rest of the animal uh, that had been cooked and give it back to the family. And Elkanah would take the meat, he would divide it up, he'd give it to his 10 children, he'd give it to Penina, but then he would take a larger portion than he gave everybody else and he would give it to Hannah. And he loved her. And the reason why he would do this is he felt bad for her because she didn't have any children. He knew how brokenhearted she was. And the way that the uh, New International Version puts it is like this. But Hannah, but but to Hannah, he he gave a double portion, a portion of the meat because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. Those words bother me. The Lord had closed her womb. He could have given her children, but he chose not to. He could have answered her prayer, but he didn't. And not having children was an emotional storm for Hannah. Because she's living in a culture and a time period of history where people genuinely believe that children are this blessing from God. And if he gives you uh, children, you're blessed. And if not, then he must be withholding his blessing from you. Children were a sign of security. They're a sign of of social status. So let's go back to that picture again. Do do you see how this is problematic for Hannah? Every day she sees Penina and her children and there's growing angst in her and there's growing bitterness and growing jealousy. It doesn't even matter that she loves God. She's dealing with these emotions. Have you ever just been in the middle of a storm and you looked at someone else who uh, in their life and they're not seeming to go through any storm and you just get jealous, you get bitter. You're like, God, here I am trying to be faithful to you, trying to serve you. And then look what's happening over here. 
They seem to have it easy. Hannah's angst that she's experiencing was not calmed by Penina. It wasn't like Penina would come around her and rub her back and say, girl, we're praying and believing God to give you kids. As a matter of fact, when the family would travel every year to the tabernacle, here's what we read. Penina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Hannah is already struggling with feelings of inferiority, but her emotional storm is made worse by harassment and rejection and jealousy. It's one of those situations in life where we just step back and we just wonder like, what good could possibly come out of this situation? It seems pointless that Hannah would have to go through this kind of ministry, uh, mi- mi- mis- Misery, not ministry. This is not a ministry. This is a misery she's going through, right? It could be the same, right? But we don't need to read Hannah's story to get us to ask the question, what good could come out of that? All of us have asked this question. What good can come out of this, right? What good can come out of this? Three and a half years ago, I officiated the wedding ceremony for a young, successful, good-looking couple. And today they're separated and they're disillusioned. They never dreamed that their marriage would end in less than five years. They're asking the question, what good could possibly come out of this? Not long ago, Rindy and I, my wife, received a invitation to a baby shower. Followed a few weeks later by the announcement of a miscarriage. The couple was devastated. When I met with them, they asked that exact question. What good can possibly come out of this? There are storms that we go through in life that seem to be worth enduring because we know that on the other side, there is a payoff. But there are other storms that just feel pointless. And that's the kind of storm that Hannah finds herself in. She's miserable. Her her life isn't unfolding the way she envisioned it. And every single year, she travels to this religious festival, this time of gratitude and worship that's supposed to be focused on the greatness of God, but she's distracted by her own emotional storm. And here's what we read. Year after year, it was the same. Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. And each time Hannah would be reduced to tears, it would not even eat. This is a Jewish holiday, supposed to be a time of celebration, and Hannah can't enjoy it. When you're in the midst of a storm, holidays are especially hard. When a couple's been married for 46 years and then the husband dies or the wife dies and now it's the first Christmas season where you're trying to celebrate without them, it's painful. It's incredibly difficult. I see the prayer requests that come through here at Timberlake Church. And it seems like almost weekly, someone is expressing grief over loss of a person in their life. When you celebrate the holidays with your family for 15 years at the same house, but then the storms of life hit, and now you're in an apartment and you're living by yourself and your family is not around. And holidays are hard. Holidays can be overwhelming for lots of different reasons. But in this story, Penina made it especially hard on Hannah, who's caught up in an emotional storm. And her husband knows that she's miserable. And so he tries to encourage her. He asks this question, why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask, why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having 10 sons? I love this. The guy's trying. Well, you got me. What are you all upset about, right? Here's a guy who's doing his best, but he says the wrong thing at the wrong time. And I want you to notice, nowhere in this story does anyone sugarcoat suffering. Hannah's emotional pain is just put right there in front of us. It's not minimized. It's not downplayed at all. It's actually highlighted. And here's here's what we read. That Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. So even though Hannah is in a storm, she chooses to anchor her hopes to the character and nature of God. She prays to the Lord. The same Lord who has closed up her womb. The same Lord who has given her no children. Who allowed her to be in this situation. This kind of thing can mess with us. If God is good and he's capable and he's powerful, why would he allow Hannah to go through this type of suffering? She loves him. 
I mean, it makes, it makes sense if he's not good or powerful or capable. But if he is, why would he allow her to experience this kind of emotional storm? Now, for some people, this is a very philosophical question. But for a lot of us, it's much more than that. It is a deep problem of the heart. If God loves me, why would he allow me to experience what I'm suffering? When, when my brother Rick was serving as a Marine uh, and was killed in Iraq back in uh, 2008, it was actually on this day 16 years ago. One thing I could not get out of my mind after that had happened was God could have kept him alive. It was actually a group of people who would pray for Rick regularly. There were other people who lived and nobody was praying for them. And Rick was killed by a roadside bomb. There were several milit uh, military vehicles in the convoy that day that drove over the, over the exact same area that Rick did. But somehow his Humvee hit the explosive device and he hit it just right and set it off. What if God is powerful and loving but still allowed Rick to be killed? Can I trust a God who allows tragedy in my life? Can I trust a God that doesn't always make sense? Hannah's story is a story of pain, but instead of running from the God who allowed that pain in her life, she runs to God and she pours out her heart to him. Now, pouring out our hearts to God is not about reciting these memorized, uh, trite, very structured, unemotional prayers. Pouring out our hearts to God is saying, God, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. This whole thing makes me wonder if you even exist. And if you do, do you even see me? This whole situation is getting me cynical. I don't want to be cynical, but God, I can't help it. I'm praying, I'm pouring out my heart to you and you just seem to be uninterested. Hannah is pouring out her heart to God and in the midst of the prayer, she makes a vow. She says, oh Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. So she promises God, if you bless me with a child, I will dedicate him back to you by having him commit a lifetime of service to you. Imagine if your parents made that commitment for you, right? I commit, this is what my kid is going to do, but this happens. And, and obviously not all stories end happily ever after. I don't want to suggest that in any way, but fast forward nine months, God does answer Hannah's prayer. She gives birth to a son. She names him Samuel, which means God has heard. And when Samuel is three or four years old, his parents bring him along to one of their annual trips to the Jewish festival. They go to the temple and they leave him with the priest to now be trained in full-time ministry. Now, it's important that I just pause here and say, please do not ever do that with your kids. I don't care if they're potty trained. Do not leave them with me. Do not leave them here. Oh, where are the parents? They took off. They want them to be trained for ministry. Here's what we read, but Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. So from very early on, Samuel's being prepared. He's being trained for leadership. People would go to the temple. They'd see Samuel kind of running around with his little priest outfit on. And, and they'd ask, well, who's that kid? And, and the answer would be, well, that's Samuel. That's Hannah's son. The son she offered to God in the midst of her emotional storm. The son she gave to the Lord in the midst of her pain and anguish and torment. And every time that his parents would come and visit him, Samuel would be a little bit taller. He'd be a little bit more mature. Here's what we read. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord and with people. So this sounds like the end of the story, but it's actually the beginning of the story. This is only chapter two of the book, and it continues until chapter 25, telling his story. Samuel goes from being a boy to being a man, and Samuel uses his mature adult voice to challenge and call on the Jewish people to surrender their idols, to destroy their idols, and to turn their hearts to God because they had turned their hearts away. That's Samuel doing that, Hannah's son, a son born after a long emotional storm filled with exhaustion and her deep pain and harassment and suffering and misery. And eventually Samuel is an elderly man and he senses God leading him to a teenage boy by the name of David. And he senses God speak to him that David is supposed to be the next king of Israel. And so Samuel, Hannah's son, takes oil and drips it over David's head. 
anointed him to be the second king of Israel. Hannah's son. And I don't tell you that story to try in any way to resolve the internal conflict that you may have when you're dealing with the aftermath of your own storm. And I don't tell you that story to suggest that we can solve the mysteries of God or that everything just ends up in a nice little wrapped up box with a bow on the top. What I am trying to communicate is that often our all-knowing, all-powerful and ever-present God chooses to bring unspeakable good out of unspeakable pain. It doesn't matter, or it doesn't matter what that pain is, God can bring good out of it. And it doesn't mean that everything turns out like we're hoping or, or praying. It doesn't mean that everything turns out better than we're hoping or praying. But I want you to know that God is a God who restores, redeems, and renews. He's able to take the ashes of our life and make something beautiful from them. He's able to take the debris from the storm and create something meaningful. After Hurricane Katrina hit back in 2005, there were artists who took some of the debris and made an entire art collection from it. They said, here's debris that we found and we're making something from it. And that's what God does with our lives. He takes the debris of the storm and he makes something meaningful from it. The apostle Paul explains it this way in a first century letter to followers of Jesus living in Rome. He says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. He doesn't say everything's good. He says, but God can work it together for good. And he says to those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Story after story after story that we come across in our Bible reminds us that even though life is filled with difficulty and betrayal and loss, and that the aftermath of any storm can be incredible destruction, that God can take the things left in the aftermath and do something good with it. God can take the the debris of the divorce. He can take the debris of the loss. He can take the anguish that we've been through and do something with it. The struggle is, often we find purpose after the storm. Almost never while we're in it. Often we find purpose after the storm. And I, I will even say this, not always. Maybe you won't ever know the good that came out of it, but it doesn't mean God isn't trying to bring good from it. In weather-related storms, we always learn something new when the storm is over, right? We become better at predicting them. Uh, meteorologists learn new things. They help reset the environment in some ways. And as humans, there is a purpose in every storm. But most of the time, we don't know it until it's, it's after. So 16 years ago, I received this call that my brother Rick had been killed. And it was the start, as you can imagine, of the most painful, gut-wrenching, emotional storm that I've ever experienced. I was miserable and heartbroken. But in the aftermath of that storm, there was a restlessness that started to grow inside of me that I could not escape. At one point, Rick and I had dreamed together and talked together about starting a church someday. We talked on several occasions and his death started to stir something within me. Within four months, of his funeral, I loaded up everything that I owned into a moving truck. My family and I moved from Bothell, Washington, where we were living at the time, to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where I had grown up, to start a church. And several of Rick's friends, as a way of honoring him, helped launch the church. They said, we're doing this in honor of Ricky. And I was with that church for 15 years. We baptized in those 15 years more than 1,000 people. Thousands of lives were impacted. It's still making an impact to this day. Now, if you're new to Timberlake and you don't realize this, I've only been at Timberlake uh, for five months as the uh, lead pastor. Prior to that, I would teach here on a regular basis, but I'm only recently new to this area. And I tell you that story because every once in a while, as we look back in our lives, I think we are given a glimpse of how God is at work through tragic events and situations, even though at the time it looked like God was absent. We may not always see the good that comes from the aftermath of the storm, but I assure you good does happen. Sometimes it's simply the work that God does in us during that time and the character he's building. Sometimes it's just the fact that we learn to draw near to God. We started trying to pursue God at a different pace than we ever had in our life. And so as we close today, I 
I do want to speak very specifically to those of you in the midst of a storm because I know it's hard to hear this and it's hard to connect the dots and it's hard to be hopeful. But you need to hear that every storm eventually ends. Every storm that has ever hit this planet, no matter how fierce, no matter how devastating, no matter how many homes were destroyed, no matter how many people died in it, at some point the storm subsided and it came to an end. And I realize there's storms like mental health storms that it feels like it's going to come and go through our entire life. Right? There are some storms that just seem to be persistent. They'll come for a while and they leave. And when they leave, they leave destruction and debris that we're picking up for years to come. And there are certain storms that in the midst of it, we feel like, I can't, I can't do this. I can't keep going. And I just want you to hear, you can. And obviously that reality is seen more easily through the lens of time. But my hope is that when heartache crashes into your life and the storms of life come on strong, I hope that by God's grace and by God's mercy, you'll have the strength to stand strong. And that you and I both in the midst of our storms can reflect the same kind of confidence that the apostle Paul had when he wrote about the storms he went through. Now in one specific section of, of his writing, he doesn't tell us what the storms were. They could have been rejection, could have been persecution, health issues, emotional storms. We don't know what the storms were, but here's what he writes. He says, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God. So even in the midst of the storm, good's happening. The God who raises the dead, and he did rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him and we will con he will continue to rescue us. If you're in the midst of a storm or have just come out of a storm, God sees the big picture. He's a God who throughout history has proved himself faithful. He's proved himself capable. He's able to extend grace to us to get us through whatever season we're going through. He is active even if it doesn't feel like it. His grace is sufficient. So is it possible for you to come to a point where you trust that our wildly mysterious God is able to bring unspeakable good out of a storm that's unspeakably bad? In just a moment, I'm going to pray for us and I'm going to pray for the storms that we're going through and for resilience. And when I'm done praying, if you want someone specifically to pray with you uh, here at the Redmond campus, we'll have people up front available to do that. Before I pray, I, I do want to extend an invitation to you. If you say, you know, Dave, I've kind of lived life on my own terms and I've been in charge of my life, but I, I don't even know what it is like to somehow try to figure out what it looks like to trust in God in the storm because I've never surrendered my life to him. I want to invite you to do that today. And, and the way you do that is just by saying, hey, I realize I'm broken. I realize I am a sinner. I realize that whatever the standards are that God's created, I'm, I'm never going to match God's standards. I can't even match my own. And so I step off the throne of my life and I invite Jesus onto the throne. And I'm going to do my best to follow Jesus, to turn my life from one direction and begin to go in the Jesus direction. And the way you learn about that is by environments like this, just gathering with us on a regular basis. We talk a lot about what it looks like to follow Jesus, even in the midst of the storm. Hannah's saying, man, I'm faithful to God. I'm still praying. I'm, I'm heartbroken, but I'm still praying. I'm still believing. I'm still trusting. And if you want to do that today, as we close in this final prayer, I just want you in your heart to say, Heavenly Father, I surrender to you. And you can even let people here at the end know if you choose to, to come up front. But I would ask you, would you fill out your connection card? Would you let us know you made a first-time decision to follow Jesus? And then in the uh, lobby at our next steps table, you can just swing by and say, hey, could I get one of the, the next steps boxes basically boxes that we put together with resources to help you get started on this spiritual journey. Would you go ahead and stand? I'm going to pray. And again, if you want to pray that prayer in your heart uh, and surrender your life to Jesus, this would be the time to do it. Heavenly Father, we just pause. We thank you that historically you have proven yourself to be a good God and a faithful God and a loving God and a merciful God. And right now, for those individuals who are surrendering their lives to you for the very first time. They're saying, I step off the throne of my life. I invite you on to that throne. I am a sinner in need of a savior. I, I, I am asking for grace to be extended. I pray that right now would be a marked moment in their life. That today they would go from walking in one direction to walking in a new direction. May they live with a confidence. And Lord, for all of us, 
as we experience storms in our life, emotional storms, relational storms, financial storms, storms of mental health, career-related storms, whatever the storms are, I pray, God, in the midst of it, you would help us to stay hopeful and help us to just continue to move forward in the midst of it, knowing someday that storm is gonna come to an end. We're gonna come out on the other side and hopefully we can look back and see the good that you can bring from it. We love you, we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. We are done being the church in here. Let's go be the church out there. We'll see ya.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Timberlake. I invite you to stand with us this morning. We're going to sing this song and declare God's goodness. Come on, let's go. I'll praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. Praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when outnumbered. Praise when surrounded. Cause praise is a wall. Come on, sing that again. 
pray. God, we, we thank you just for the incredible difference that only you can make in our lives and through our lives. God, so many of us have experienced the, the difference that you make when we choose to put you at the center, that you make everything better, that our priorities are better when you're at the center, our relationships are better when you're at the center, our thoughts are better when you're at the center. And so God, I just pray that, that today for all my friends that are here, for those of us who have experienced that reality and those of us who are maybe searching for something deeper, God, I pray that today that we would leave encouraged and challenged and changed because you are so good to us when we just simply choose to engage in relationship with you. We love you and we thank you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Timberlake. I'm so glad that you are here. I hope you're having a great weekend so far. When you came in, you received a program. There's some helpful things for you to follow along with the service today. There's also a Connect card. If this is one of your first few times at Timberlake or you just wanna get more involved, uh, fill out that Connect card. There's also a QR code on the back of the seat in front of you. There's a link uh, online as well that you can use. Uh, So many great things are coming up this spring. In addition to our spring groups that launch launch this month, which you should definitely check out. We also have a couple different Connect events uh, that are happening. We have a men's breakfast that is happening this coming Saturday. Uh, For all the guys, would love for you to join us for that. There's food, just a time of connection. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then the following Friday, we have our annual uh, ladies event uh, that I hope you will uh, mark on your calendar, invite a friend, and plan on being there uh, for those. Great opportunities just to meet some people and get connected. Uh, this spring. We're also going to receive an offering. If you would like to invest financially in the mission and ministry here at Timberlake, you can do that through our app or through our website, or there's giving kiosks in the back of the room uh, that you can use as well. But your generosity, it makes a huge difference. Not only uh, does it help us to keep the lights on and, and buy the coffee and snacks, but way more important than that is helping people experience life transformation through Jesus. And ultimately, that's at the center of everything uh, that we do Two weeks ago, we had our Easter experiences, and they were just incredible. I know many of you were able to join us uh, for those. But sometimes when you're just at a single service or you miss a weekend, you don't always get to see the impact that Jesus is having through uh, this ministry across uh, all of our campuses. And so the team put together a recap video uh, that we wanted you to take a look at. So you can have a seat and watch this video. Good morning. Yes. Let's kick off today with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to have been involved at the Easter services. We thank you for what you did in us and through us. And we are grateful that as you are building your kingdom, you are choosing to allow us to be part of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, what a cool, cool week and a great reminder that our church is spread out and God is doing a good work and is using us as part of it. So just over 30 years ago in October of 1991, uh, the Andrea Gale, which was a 72 foot long commercial fishing boat, left a port in New England uh, and headed for the Atlantic Ocean. Supposed to be just a typical journey for her, but it ended up being her last journey. And the reason why was... When the Andrea Gale was 180 miles away from land, she encountered one of the most powerful forces on planet Earth. 
a full-blown hurricane over the open seas. Now, sometimes it's referred to as a tropical cyclone. Other times it's uh, referred to as a typhoon, depending on where it's located. But a hurricane open, over the open seas is, is incredibly powerful. It releases the energy equivalent to 10 atomic bom bombs every single second. Uh, birds have been known to drown mid-flight during a hurricane because water gets in their upward-facing nostrils. And the Andrea Gale had the misfortune of running into a storm that was the result of three different weather patterns merging together. It was so powerful, uh, it created waves 100 feet tall. There were wind speeds of 75 miles an hour that were measured. And that, by the way, was sustained wind speeds because uh, they were definitely higher than that. Um, just an apocalyptic type of situation. And it created $200 million in damage to coastal towns and to homes. As you can imagine, the Andrea Gale never stood a chance. All six crew members vanished forever. Only a little bit of debris has ever been recovered. It's just a captivating story. So much so that six years after these events, it was, uh, the story was turned into a book called The Perfect Storm. And then a movie came out with George Clooney called The Perfect Storm. And it's just this thing that just fascinated us as humans. Storms have immense power and can leave an aftermath of intense destruction. So last week, what we did is we kicked off a two-week teaching series about the storms in our life. And we talked about how do we respond to the scary, unpredictable, turbulent, and overwhelming events that unfold while we're on this planet. Now, if you missed last week, um, let me give you just a quick recap. All right, we talked about three realities of life storms. The, the first is this, everyone encounters storms, relationship storms, parenting storms, financial storms, storms related to career, storms related to emotional health, mental health, uh, storms re related to physical health, right? All types of storms. And the thing about storms is even though we all experience them, nobody gets to choose their storms. Sometimes the decisions we make result in a storm, but we don't get to choose the exact type, how long it lasts, or how destructive it is. That's the bad news. The good news is when storms come our way, even if they're a result of our own decisions, we can choose how we respond to them. Now, all of us, just naturally being humans, want to respond in healthy ways, right? When a storm comes our way, we want to be wise in how we respond. It. We, we, we want to make them you know, most of it. We want to learn the most, all of that stuff. But why is it so difficult? Why is it such a challenge to do that? Well, it's because storms impact our emotions. When, when we're in a season of life where it just feels like everything has come together at once and conspired against us, and now we find ourselves in what we would consider the perfect storm, it messes with us emotionally. And it doesn't matter what your personality or temperament is. Sometimes that storm messes with us in a way that we become emotionally numb. We stop caring, we check out, we don't feel much. People drain us, we don't want to be around people. And when you're in a storm, what happens is when we become numb, we actually like feeling that way. We like feeling numb. We, 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 we don't want to feel the emotions of the storm. And so it's like, this is a good thing. Um, but, it, but it's actually dangerous. There's a very rare condition known as congenital insensitivity to pain and anhydrosis. And people living with this condition can't feel pain, which seems like it would be a big blessing, but it's actually in many ways a curse because they can step on a nail and not realize they stepped on a nail. They can get cuts and bruises and abrasions and all of that stuff and, and not even realize that something is wrong. So it's incredibly dangerous to go through a time uh, to, to, to be numb to, to pain. And, and when we become emotionally numb, the same thing is true. Because we stop feeling our convictions and values the same way we would if we were healthy. This is why a lot of people in the midst of a storm, when they become emotionally numb, they make decisions that shipwreck their lives. And the decisions don't line up with their values. It doesn't line up with things that they believe for their entire life. It's just they're numb. So sometimes storms as they impact our emotions, cause us to be emotionally numb. Other times, uh, what happens in the midst of a storm is we become disproportionately emotional, right? Someone criticizes us and we become defensive and we become angry, we get into a rage. I've even watched people with even keeled temperaments who when a storm hits, they, they just become disproportionately emotional. And the scriptures, believe it or not, are jam-packed of stories of people who love God, people who are committed to serving him, but a storm comes and their emotions are all over the map. Moses, a very godly man, 
one of the heroes of the Jewish people. Moses experiences several leadership storms and it depletes him so much that eventually he gets to a point where he says, I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Do me a favor and spare me this misery. That's how I pray every Sunday after hanging out with you. (laughs) When the Jewish prophet Jeremiah experienced ongoing storms of rejection in isolation and loneliness, He launches into a prayer in which he declares the greatness of God and says, God, you are faithful and you are this and you are that. And then he just like stops mid prayer and he says, yet I curse the day I was born. May no one celebrate the day of my birth. I curse the messenger who told my father, good news, you have a son. He sounds like an overly emotional teenager whose phone's been taken away, right? I curse the day I was born. One of the most famous stories in all the Bible is a guy by the name of Job, a godly man who goes through a series of of storms, health storms, storms uh, of losing his family members to death, some of them, uh, his fortune taken away. And he he starts off so optimistic and he's talking about the faithfulness of God and the goodness of God. And it just gets to a point where he can't take it anymore. And he, he says these words, he says, God, I would rather be strangled, rather die than suffer like this. I hate my life and don't want to go on living. Now, these are not isolated verses. These are not just outliers in the lives of individuals who went through storms that we read about in the scriptures. It's just a reality of life. As as the storm continues to grow in duration or destructiveness, our emotions are impacted in in a big way. This is why when we're in the midst of a powerful storm, it's almost impossible to stay hopeful. You wanna be, you wanna say God is good. You may even gather together with your church family. You may sing songs of worship that declare how good God is. But it's hard if you're in the midst of a storm. And I do want you to know, if you're in the midst of a storm today, I know it's hard to see, it's hard to believe, but storms can serve a purpose. Absolutely can serve a purpose. And I'm not in any way minimizing the storm or the pain or the difficulty you're going through right now. I'm not suggesting you should chase storms. I'm not suggesting you should make decisions that bring storms into your life. What I am saying is regardless of the aftermath of whatever storm you're going through creates, purpose can come out of that. Last week, I was on a relatively easy eight-mile hike, and while I'm walking, there is this couple that just runs by me, and they're loaded up with water bottles, and they're loaded up with uh, little uh, fanny pack type of things, right, which obviously they have food or something in there, and they're running, and, and, and I just look at them, and like, that's pretty impressive as a couple, and then about an hour later, they come running by me. I'm like, they're still running? That's, that's crazy, right? It's obviously, they're preparing for some sort of race or marathon, and the question that went through my mind is, what kind of mental disorder does someone have to have to choose to do this? Right? And the answer is, There is actually personal gratification in training and then completing a 26.2 mile race. It doesn't even really matter what the finish time is. It's just the, the, the joy of saying, I did it. And as humans, we have this ability to embrace pain, sometimes even go after pain if we know there's a payoff at the end. But if it doesn't make sense, obviously we're gonna run from it. There are some people who they would never run in a marathon, but they would make the choice to go on an international fight flight And they will sit in a very small chair for 10 or 15, maybe 24 hours. Sometimes tuck between two people they don't even know. Why would they expose themselves to prolong discomfort? Well, the answer is if you want to explore Thailand or visit South Africa or Australia or go somewhere exotic like Wenatchee, you sitting in a small chair for 24 hours might be worth it. If on the other end, there is exploration and adventure and rest and relaxation and experiencing a different culture. We have the ability to endure pain and even embrace it, sometimes even go after it, if it is beneficial. And we see that. If we say, oh, there's a purpose at the other end. I mean, most obvious illustration is women, uh, labor and delivery, right? Childbirth is one of the most physically demanding and emotionally intense experiences a woman can go through other than marriage. And and women, in some instances, choose to not only do this once, they'll go through it multiple times. And it's not because they want less sleep and more stress, it's because on the other side of that pain is a child. So again, we can embrace pain when we see purpose in it and we know what the outcome is gonna be. Unfortunately, when the storms of life hit us, it often feels like there's no rhyme or reason to what we're going through. 
It often feels like there's absolutely no purpose. And because our emotions are all over the place, it doesn't matter what our beliefs are. It doesn't matter what our values are. We kind of throw them out the window at the time. Because we can't see the other side of the storm. And so the question we all need to just pause and consider at some point is, how can I find purpose in my pain? Now, in the, during the storm, it's hard to do this. I get that. But at some point, we have to ask, how can I find purpose in this? And all throughout the scriptures, we come across the stories of men and women, individuals, families, the, you know, the whole gamut, where they had to endure storms of drama, distress, emotional suffering, leadership suffering, all of that type of stuff. And they figure out how to make it through. And, and while they're in the midst of the storm, they're saying, God, take me. I, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't live. And then they get to the other side and they're able to look back with a little bit more clarity. Well, one of the stories that I want to uh, anchor in on today is recorded for us in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, it takes place at a time where uh, the nation of Israel is adrift. They're really uh, made up at the time of just a, a, confederate of, uh, a confederation of tribes. And, and they're just adrift as a nation. And right at the start of the story, we are introduced to a family, specifically an individual who's in the middle of an emotional storm. Now, the patriarch of the family is a guy by the name of Elkanah. Here's what we read about Elkanah. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah did not. Now, in ancient Jewish culture, polygamy was not forbidden, but it wasn't that widely practiced. You had to be fairly wealthy to afford a couple of wives. Uh, so we assume Elkanah was well off. Uh, he did have two wives, and, and we learn that there was jealousy and tension between them. Which kind of surprises me, right? I can't ever imagine how having sister wives could go wrong, but it does. <laughs> and, and we don't read this in the story, but Jewish tradition tells us that Elkanah and Hannah had been married for 10 years. They were unable to have kids. And uh, Elkanah decides, hey, I want to continue the family tree. So he goes and he finds a, a baby mama, Penina, and they start having children together. And according to tradition, Penina ended up having 10 children. So check this out. You've got Hannah over here, you've got Elkanah, and then you've got Penina and her children. You think your family's dysfunctional? You can imagine the drama this creates. And right at the start of the story, we learn about Elkanah, that he is a man who loves God. Uh, every year, he made it a practice to leave the town he was living in, and he traveled for 15 miles with his family um, to uh, a town called Shiloh, which is where the tabernacle uh, was located in that area. So this is about a day's journey for him and his family, a day's journey there, a day's journey back. It required some commitment. Tabernacle is where the Jewish people uh, would worship, um, uh, you know, before they actually had a, a, a temple. It was just a portable place of worship. And so Elkanah and his family, faithful year after year after year, and they would Along with the family, they would bring an animal to sacrifice. And the way it worked is the, the priest would sacrifice an animal. They would take a portion of it and you know, burn it as a sacrifice to the Lord. They would take the other part of the animal and give it back to the family uh, for them to eat. And Elkanah would take this animal and he, uh, cut it into pieces. And he'd give some to each of his 10 kids, give some to Penina. But we read that because he loved Hannah, because he saw how much anguish Hannah was in for not having kids, he would actually give her more. He gave her a double portion. And here's what we read in the New International Version. It puts it really simply. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. The Lord had closed her womb. Those words bother me. He could have given her children, but he didn't. He could have answered her prayer, but he chose not to. And not having children had created an emotional storm for Hannah because she's living at a time period in history and in a culture where they genuinely believe that having children is a sign of God's blessing. And if you uh, didn't have children, they believe something must be wrong. You must have made God angry. Children were a sign of security and social status. So let's go back to the family picture. Do you see the problem? Hannah feels alone. She feels isolated. She feels like a loser because every day she has to look at Panina and her children and she experiences, she's human. She loves God, but there's growing angst. There's bitterness. There's jealousy happening inside of her. Have you ever been in the middle of a storm and you're feeling crushed and you're like, God, I'm trying to pray. I'm trying to be faithful uh, to you. I'm trying to live out and, and obey what I want, what I know you want me to do, but I'm looking at them and, and basically they've rejected you. And yet it seems like you're blessing their life. And Hannah's angst, her, her depression, her, her just frustration would be fueled during these annual trips to the tabernacle. 
Because the whole family would travel together. And here's what we read would happen on the journey. Panina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. So Hannah's already feeling inferior, but her emotional storm is made worse by harassment and rejection and jealousy. It's one of those times in life where you just look back and you just say, what good could possibly come out of this? And we don't need Hannah and her story to ask that question because we've all asked it at some level at one time or another. What good can come out of this? Three and a half years ago, I officiated the wedding of a young, successful, good-looking couple, friends of mine. Today, they're separated and disillusioned. Neither of them imagined that within five years, their marriage would be wrapping up. And of course, they're asking the question, what good could possibly come from this? Not long ago, Rennie and I received a baby shower invitation. And then a few weeks later, it was followed up by the announcement of a miscarriage. As you can imagine, when that couple met with me, they literally asked that question in those words, what good could possibly come out of this? And I've learned to not try to give an answer. There are storms that we go through in life that seem to be worth enduring because we can see what's on the other side, but other storms that just feel pointless. And that's the kind of storm that Hannah finds herself in. She's miserable. Her life is not unfolding the way she wanted it to. Every year she would travel to this uh, religious festival, a time of gratitude, a time of worshiping God, but she would be experiencing the emotional storm. In fact, here's what we read happened on the way to the tabernacle. Year after year, it was the same. Panina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. It's a Jewish holiday. Hannah cannot even enjoy it. When you are in the middle of a storm or have just come out of the storm, holidays, celebrations can be difficult. Even if there's nobody there taunting you. When a couple's been married 46 years and the husband dies or the wife dies and this is the first Christmas that you're trying to get through and celebrate without them, that can be very difficult. I see the prayer requests that come through here at Timberlake Church and it seems like every week somebody's asking for prayer because they're dealing with the loss of someone they love. When you've celebrated holidays with your family for 15 years, but now you've gone through a storm that has decimated your family and you're living in a one bedroom apartment by yourself and you are not able to celebrate with your kids or, or your spouse. Holidays are hard. Holidays can be overwhelming for all sorts of reasons. But in this story, Penina is making it overly difficult for Hannah who's in this emotional storm. And her husband knows that she's emotional. And he knows that she's a star. He sees her crying and he tries to encourage her. He asks, why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask, why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having 10 sons? <laughs> this is every guy's hero. <laughs> we got me. What's the big deal? Come on. Right, saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, but he's trying. And I want you to notice nowhere in the story does anyone downplay Hannah's suffering. Now, he seems to be missing out on why it's happening, but here's the deal. Her emotional pain is described in detail. It's highlighted. And here's what we read, that Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. Even though she's in an emotional storm and the Lord has closed her womb, she is praying to that Lord. The same Lord who has chosen to not answer her prayers. The same Lord who has given her no children. This can mess with us. If God is good and capable and powerful, why would he allow Hannah to experience this kind of pain? Especially when he seems to be blessing Penina. I mean, if he's not good or capable, it, 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 this makes sense. But if he is, why would he allow her to experience this kind of emotional storm? And there's going to be some people for this, them, this is a big philosophical question. But for most of us, this is a deep issue of the heart. If God loves me, why would he allow me to experience what I'm experiencing? So 16 years ago today, my brother Rick was killed while serving in Iraq as a Marine. And back when he was killed, it was 2008. And the, I, I seem to embrace, say, hey, death is part of this, but I could not get out of my mind. If God could have kept him alive, why didn't he do that? I mean, Rick had an entire team of people that would pray for him here in the States as he was serving. 
There were a lot of people. Nobody was praying for them. They lived. And he was killed by a roadside bomb. There were several military vehicles who had gone over and drove over the exact same area that Rick did, but somehow his Humvee hit the explosive device just right and set it off. And even then, Rick and his buddy Dean were both killed, but there was one of the guys in the Humvee that, that survived. What if God is powerful and loving, but still allow Rick to be killed? Can I trust a God who allows tragedy? Can I trust a God who doesn't always make sense? Hannah's story is a story of pain, but instead of running from the God who allows that pain in her life, she runs to God and she pours out her heart to him. Pouring out our hearts is not about praying these trite, memorized, wrote prayers with no emotion. Pouring out our hearts is saying, God, I don't get you. I'm ticked. I'm upset. I don't see how you can look at me and allow this to continue. I'm trying to be faithful to you. You are not being faithful in return. I'm getting cynical. I don't want to be cynical, but this is the reality of the situation. You're not giving me the strength. You're not, giving, you're not helping me. It seems like you're ignoring me. And so Hannah is pouring out her heart to God. And in the midst of her prayer, she makes a vow to God. Oh, Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. Like, I'm so sick and tired of praying that, God, here's the deal. I'm going to surrender my son to you, and I'm going to commit that he will spend his entire life serving you in ministry. Now, obviously, not all stories end happily ever after. But fast forward nine months, God does answer Hannah's prayer. She gives birth to a son. They name him Samuel, which means God has heard. And when Samuel is three or four years old, on an annual trip to the tabernacle, they bring Samuel along with him, or along with them. And they get to the tabernacle and they go to the, the priest and they say, hey, we have surrendered and committed our son to the Lord for ministry. We're going to leave him with you to train him for ministry. Three or four years old. I just want to pause here and say, don't ever do that. I don't care if you feel like, oh, God's calling my kid into ministry, even if they're potty trained. I do not want to be responsible for them. Do not leave them here, all right? So we read, but Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord, and he wore a linen garment like that of a priest. This is crazy. He's just, uh, you know, a preschooler, and he's walking around with this priest outfit on. And he's being trained for, for ministry and for leadership. And people would go to the tabernacle and he'd go running by and they'd say, who, who is this? And the answer would be, well, well, that's Samuel. That's Hannah's son. A son born to her out of emotional storm. A son born to her in pain and distress. She surrendered him to the Lord. And every time his parents would come and, and visit, they would notice that Samuel's getting taller and he's becoming more mature. We read that meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord and with the people. Now it kind of sounds like the end of the story, but it's actually the beginning of the story. We're only in chapter two. Samuel's story continues under chapter 25. He goes from being a little boy to being a man and he uses his adult male voice to challenge the people of Israel and to call on them to surrender their idols and to get rid of their idols and to turn their hearts back towards God because they had, they had kind of walked away and rejected God. That's Samuel, Hannah's son, doing that. Eventually, Samuel is an elderly man, and he senses God identifying, uh, helping him identify a teenage boy who's supposed to uh, be the second king of Israel, a, a, a guy by the name of David. And, and so Samuel, Hannah's son, born out of emotional distress, born in the midst of a storm for her, takes some oil and he drips it on David's head and anoints him to be the second king. Samuel, Hannah's son. And I don't tell you these stories to try to resolve whatever conflict that you might have as you're dealing with the aftermath of the storms that you've gone through. And I don't tell you that story to suggest that we can understand the mysteries of God or connect all the dots or that every story is like a package with a bow on top. I, I don't believe that. What I am trying to say is often our all-knowing, all-powerful, and ever-present God chooses to bring unspeakable good out of unspeakable pain doesn't mean everything turns out like we're praying or hoping 
Doesn't mean everything's better than we were hoping or praying. It does mean that God is a God who redeems, restores, and renews. He is able to take the ashes of our life and make something meaningful from them. He's able to take the debris of the storm that just feels like this thing is just a waste and he's able to do something with them. After Hurricane Katrina hit back in 2005, there were artists who decided to pick up some of the debris and create pieces of art from it. And they have an entire collection of art that was made from the debris. That is what God does with our lives. He takes debris from the storm and makes something meaningful from it. The apostle Paul, in writing to followers of Jesus in Rome, going through difficulty, reminds them of God's power. He says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good. He doesn't say everything's good, right? He said, but everything can work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And story after story that we come across in the Bible reminds us that life is filled with difficulty, betrayal, and loss. But God takes the aftermath of every storm. He takes every bit of debris and he is able to use it for good. God can take the divorce. He can take the loss. He can take the parenting challenges. He can take the anguish you're going through and do something with it. But here's the discouraging part. Often we find purpose after the storm. Sometimes we find it during the storm, but often it's not until it's over. In weather related storms, once the storm's over, even the perfect storm, it's, you know, the meteorologists learn from that. There's lessons, they're able to predict things better. Storms can help reset the environment in different ways. And after our own storm, sometimes after the storm, we're able to look back and we're able to see purpose. So on April 14, 2008, when I received the call that my brother Rick had been killed, obviously it kick-started the most painful, gut-wrenching, emotional storm I'd ever gone through. I was incredibly miserable. I was heartbroken. But in the aftermath of losing Rick, there was a restlessness that started to grow inside of me. At one point, Rick and I had talked about uh, starting a church together in my hometown of Kenosha, Wisconsin. And his death just started to stir some things inside of me. And within four months of his funeral, I was living in Bothell, Washington at the time. Uh, within four months of his funeral, I had packed up an entire moving truck and my wife and my kids, we were headed to Kenosha to start a church. And several of Rick's friends Day one joined in and they said, we're, we're part of this church because uh, of our commitment to Rick. And it was a church that I was with for 15 years. Uh, it grew, we ended up baptizing more than a thousand people. Thousands of lives were impacted. And it's a church that's still thriving today. If you're new to Timberlake, I've only been the lead pastor for five months. Prior to this, I was pastoring in Wisconsin. But I tell you that story because every once in a while, as we look back at our lives, I think we're given a glimpse of how God is at work through tragic events and situations. Even though at the time, it seemed like God was absent. And we may not always see the good that comes from the aftermath, but I'm telling you, it's there. Even if it was during the storm, I started to pursue God more than any other time in my life. Or because of that storm, I started to realize I can't do this in my own strength and I, and I called out to God. As we close today, I, I wanna to just be very candid with those of you in the middle of a storm or you know someone going through a storm. And it's something that hopefully will bring you some sort of peace, some sort of hope, and that is this, every storm eventually ends. Every single storm that's ever hit this planet, no matter how fierce, no matter how devastating, no matter how many homes were destroyed, no matter how many people died in it, at some point, the storm subsided. It came to an end. I alluded to this last week. I do realize there are some storms like mental health storms that just seem to kind of come and go through our entire life. And there are certainly storms that we feel their impact and it starts to subside and then we feel it again. And it, here's what I need you to hear. When you're in a storm and you feel convinced this is never going to come to an end, it will. I promise you. It may, it may come back again a year later, two years later, but I'm telling you, storms end. And, and 
Obviously, that reality is definitely seen more through the lens of time, but my hope is that when heartache crashes into our lives and storms come on strong, by God's grace, by God's mercy, my hope, my prayer is that we can somehow remain strong and that we can come to the point of confidence like the Apostle Paul did when he experienced life storms. And I don't know that he responded to every storm this way. I think there was a, there, there was a lot of different things that he went through that built his faith, but he writes about one storm that he went through and it wasn't necessarily even a physical storm. It could have been emotional, could have been persecution, could have been health issues, but he, he writes about it and he says, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. He says, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God who raises the dead. In other words, there was good that came out of this. And he did rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. So if you're in a storm, you've just come out of a storm, God sees the big picture. He's active even when you don't feel like it. He's a good, good father. He's faithful. And throughout history, he's been taking the debris of storms and making something with it. Now just a moment, I'm gonna pray over us because I know there's a lot of storms represented today. But if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I wanna invite you to do that. I'm gonna give you that opportunity. And basically, what surrendering our life to Jesus looks like is saying, God, I recognize that I am a sinner. I recognize that my life is broken. As hard as I try, as disciplined as I try to be, I'm never gonna measure up to whatever standards you have. I'm always gonna fall short. So I'm not gonna put any confidence in me, I'm gonna put it in you. I step off the throne of my life and I invite you onto the throne. And then I'm gonna do my best to follow you. I'm gonna go from walking kind of in my own direction and doing my thing, as good as I may be, as, as disciplined as I may be, but I'm going to do my best to turn and follow you and go in the direction you wanna lead. And so as we pray a final prayer, if you say, hey, that's what I wanna to do today, I wanna to invite you to do so. And then I ask you to just take your connection card and just fill it out and just put, I'm making a first time decision to follow Jesus. And then swing by the next steps table in the lobby. And we've got a box filled with resources that we want to give to you. Kind of help you get started in this journey. And uh, all you need to do is swing by there and say, give me one of those boxes. And uh, they'd be happy to do that. It would be our honor. Would you stand together and we're going to pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. I pray today for those who for the very first time are surrendering their lives to Jesus. Right now in this moment, as they say, I surrender. I receive your grace. I receive your forgiveness. May today be a marked day for them. May today be a day that they can look back and say, when I go through the storms of life, it was that day that gave me hope. It was that day that gave me courage because now I know God is with me in the midst of my storm. And Lord, for those today going through parenting storms, for those going through storms of addiction, for those going through storms of finances, for those going through career storms, mental health storms, I pray in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, that you would give us the strength, the courage, and the hope we need to get through the storm. And on the other end of that storm, to be able to look back and see some of the good you're bringing from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being here today. If you want someone specifically to pray with you, or maybe you just said, hey, I, I did pray that prayer of like surrender to Jesus. I just want to talk with someone about it or have some questions. There will be people up front to pray with you, but now we are done being the church in here. Let's go be the church out there. We'll see you.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Timber Lake. I invite you to stand and sing with us. Here we go. I'll praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure and praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered and praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the waters, my
God, we, we thank you for the incredible difference that you can make in our lives and through our lives. And God, I just know that so many of us have experienced what happens when we choose to put you at the center and how that impacts everything else that our lives are better when you are at the center. Our relationships are better when you're at the center. Our thoughts and our priorities and everything about us is better when we choose to put you at the center. And so God, I just pray for all my friends who are here today, for those of us who have experienced that reality and those of us who are maybe searching for something deeper today. I pray that for all of us that we would leave today encouraged and refreshed and challenged because of your great love for us. We thank you for it. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Timberlake. I'm so glad that you're here. I hope you're having a great weekend so far. Uh, when you came in, you received a program. There's a way for you to follow along with the service. There's also a connect card in there. We would simply love to know that you're here. If this is one of your first few times at Timberlake or you just wanna get more uh, involved, uh, fill that card out. There's also a QR code in the back of the seat in front of you. And there's a link online for you to use as well. And uh, someone get, will get in contact with you. Uh, we have so many great things coming up this spring and ways for you to get involved, not only are our spring growth groups uh, launching this month. But we also have a couple connect events uh, that I hope you're planning on being a part of. This Friday, we have, no, this Saturday, this Saturday, we have a men's breakfast coming up. And so I really hope that you're able to join us for that. If you're a guy, it's just gonna be a time of great food and a time to connect for that. And then the following Friday, uh, we have our annual women's event. And so please plan on joining us for those. They're gonna be uh, great opportunities uh, just to get connected and meet some people and grow in your faith as well. We're also going to receive an offering if you would like to invest financially in the mission and ministry here at Timberlake. Uh, you can do that through our website, through our app, or there's giving kiosks in the back of the room. Uh, your generosity not only helps us to keep the lights on and buy the coffee and the snacks, but way more important than that, uh, it helps so many people experience life transformation through Jesus. And ultimately, that's at the heart of everything that we do. And so uh, two weeks ago, we had Easter, incredible experience here at Timberlake. Lake. And I know uh, for many of us, we only get to see uh, a single service each week, and you don't always get to see uh, the incredible impact that Jesus is having uh, across all of our campuses uh, through this ministry. And so the team put together a recap video uh, that I want you to take a look at so you can have a seat and then watch this video. It's easy to forget this, but we are a church that meets in multiple locations. And so we get to experience at the Redmond campus what's happening here, but there are things happening at other campuses as well. So Heavenly Father, we pause to thank you that you have allowed us to be a part of building your kingdom. I pray that you would help our hearts to remain pure before you, our motives to remain pure. May we continue to be a small part of what you are doing in this area. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, just over 30 years ago, in October of 1991, the Andrea Gale, which is a 72-foot-long uh, uh, commercial fishing boat, left a port in New England and headed for the Atlantic Ocean. It was supposed to be just a standard trip, but it ended up being the last one for her. And the reason why is because 180 miles away from land, the Andrea Gale encountered uh, one of the most powerful forces on planet Earth a full-blown hurricane. 
Now, sometimes it's referred to as a tropical cyclone, other times a typhoon, depending on where it's located. But a hurricane over the ocean is incredibly powerful. It releases an energy equivalent to 10 atomic bombs every single second. Birds have been known to drown mid-flight just simply because water gets into their nostrils. And the Andrea Gale has this misfortune of getting caught up in a storm, which is the result of three different weather systems merging together. It was so powerful, it created waves as tall as 100 feet high. Sustained wind speeds were measured at 75 miles an hour. Absolutely apocalyptic type of situation. It created $200 million in damage to coastal towns and to homes. And so the Andrea Gale never stands a chance. Right? All six of the crew members vanished forever. Only a little bit of debris was ever recovered. You know, such a fascinating story that six years after these events unfolded, a book was written about this called The Perfect Storm. And then a movie with uh, George Clooney was produced with the same name, The Perfect Storm. Storms are mesmerizing. Right? They're intriguing when you consider the destruction that they're able to cause. And, and last week, we kicked off a, just a very short two-week series on storms. And how we navigate the scary, unpredictable, turbulent, and overwhelming events that unfold in our lives. And so, like I said last week, you know, this isn't stand-up comedy. There's a lot of pain associated with storms. And although I try to be lighthearted throughout the talk, the fact is, storms uh, have a way of crushing us. And if you missed last week, let me just give you a quick recap of the three realities of every storm. And that is, uh, number one, everyone encounters storms. There's not a single person on this planet exempt from storms, financial storms, parenting storms, emotional health, physical health, like storms related to careers. Like there's all types of storms that we experience in life. And the thing about storms is nobody gets to choose their storms. Sometimes we make decisions that create a storm, but we don't get to choose the exact type of storm, how long it lasts and the type of destruction that it does. That's why two people who make the exact same decision that bring about storms can experience very different types of storms. And, and, and that's the bad news that we don't get to choose our storms. The good news is we can choose how we respond to storms. Now, this is where things get confusing because as humans, we want to respond in healthy ways and in productive ways. We want to be people of wisdom. And yet when storms come upon us, it just feels like it's almost impossible to make wise decisions. And a lot of people in the middle of a storm, good people, godly people, make destructive decisions and shipwreck their life. Well, why is that so common? Well, it's because storms impact our emotions. When we're in a season of life where it just feels like everything's come together to conspire against us, our emotions are going to get impacted. And it doesn't matter what your temperament is, doesn't matter what your personality, our, our emotions get impacted in a different way. Sometimes what happens is we become emotionally numb. So we stop caring, we check out, we don't feel much. I've known people who are very empathetic in their personalities. They are very emotional people. They have a sense of what's going on. And I've watched them become emotionally numb in the middle of a storm. People who love hanging out with people stop hanging out with others. Storms impact our emotions. So sometimes, again, we become emotionally numb. And there's a the very rare condition called congenital insensitivity to pain and anhydrosis. And it's a condition in which people are, uh, can't feel pain. Physical pain. They could step on a rusty nail. They don't even realize they've done it. Then get a bruise and a break. Now, on the surface, it's like, dude, that's a superpower. I would love to not be able to feel pain. But as you can imagine, if you get a little cut and you can't feel it, now it gets infected, it's actually incredibly dangerous. And when we become emotionally numb and we can't feel our values or our beliefs the way we used to, we're just kind of coasting. That's, that's a scary place to be. And that's why, again, people will shipwreck their life in the midst of being emotionally numb. So that's one way that storms impact our emotion, uh, another way that storms impact our emotions is uh, we become disproportionately emotional. So someone criticizes us, someone says something to us, and it's like we overreact, right? We, we have outbursts of anger or rage or, or frustration. And, and the scriptures are jam-packed with good and godly men and women who experience storms in their life. And those storms uh, did something inside of them that they responded in ways we would never expect them to respond. So, so Moses, who's one of the great leaders of the Jewish people, when he went through several leadership storms in a row, he got so depleted, he, he prays out and, and he says, God, I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Do me a favor and spare me this misery. It's the same prayer I have every Sunday afternoon after hanging out with you guys, right? <laughs> 
When the Jewish prophet Jeremiah experienced ongoing storms of rejection and loneliness, it became too much for him. And he launches into a prayer in which he talks about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. And yet, this is what he says, in the midst of talking about how good God is, he says, yet I curse the day I was born. May no one celebrate the day of my birth. I curse the messenger who told my father, good news, you have a son. Sounds like an emotionally, uh, over emotional teenager, right? When you take a cell phone away from them. I just curse the day of my birth. I don't want to be around anymore. But that, that's, that's what happens with emotion. Uh, one of the most famous stories in our Bible is a story of a good and godly man named Job who experiences several destructive storms that affect his physical health, uh, some of the members of his own family. It's another storm he goes through, uh, die. He loses some of his wealth. And here's a guy who starts off very optimistic, but by the end of these storms, he just can't take it anymore. And he cries out and he says, God, I would rather be strangled rather than die. Uh, or I would rather be strangled, rather die than suffer like this. I hate my life and don't want to go on living. These are not outlier verses in the scripture. This is the response of so many people who experienced ongoing pain and suffering. And the reality is as storms grow in duration, as they grow in intensity, as they grow in destructiveness, our emotions are impacted in a a big way. And this is why in the middle of a storm, it's almost impossible to stay hopeful. We can gather together with our church family. We can try to refocus our minds on God through music. And we can try to pray and get with people in in a small group setting and say, God is good. God is faithful. But in the middle of a storm, we lose hope. And if that's where you're at today, I I don't want to be insensitive. I do want to remind you that storms can serve a purpose. Storms can serve a purpose. Now, I'm not minimizing anybody's pain. I'm not even suggesting that we should pursue storms. That we should make decisions that bring storms upon us because, well, they're going to, you know, good can come out of it and they can serve a purpose. No, they can serve a purpose, but we, we should not invite storms into our life. I just want to let you know that There is a payoff after the pain. Last week, I was on a relatively easy eight mile hike. And while I was hiking, there's this couple that goes running by me uh, together and they've got their water bottles and their fanny pack. And it just, they're on a mission. About an hour later, they come running by me again in the opposite direction. It's obvious they're training for some sort of marathon. And the, the question that went through my mind is what kind of, mental health issues do you need to have to get motivated to do such a thing? Right, of course the answer is there is an incredible amount of personal gratification in training and then completing a 26.2 mile race. It doesn't even matter what your time is, it's just the fact you completed it. As humans, we do embrace pain, sometimes we even go after it if we see that there's a payoff. There are some people, they never run a marathon. But they will sit for 15 hours, 20 hours, sometimes 24 hours in a small seat on a plane, tucked between, in some cases, two people that they don't even know. What would cause someone to do something that causes that kind of discomfort? And the answer is, if you want to explore Thailand or South Africa or Australia or go somewhere exotic like Wenatchee, the pain of being stuffed in a small chair for 24 hours can be worth it if on the other end there's exploration and adventure and rest and relaxation and you're getting to explore a different culture. We can endure pain or inconvenience when we sense a purpose in it. The most obvious illustration, right, is women who go through labor and delivery. Childbirth is one of the most physically demanding and emotionally intense experiences a woman can go through other than marriage. And, but some women, They choose to go through it, not just once, they'll go through it multiple times. Why? It's not because they want less sleep and more stress. It's because on the other side of that pain is a child. We embrace suffering when we sense that there's a point or purpose to our suffering. When we, even if we don't sense there's going to be pain or purpose, if we know what the outcome is going to be, even if we don't like it, it's, it's easy, it's easier to accept. But unfortunately, when the storms of life hit us, there often feels like there's no rhyme or reason. It's hard to connect the dots. So we start to lose hope. We don't think about the payoff or the reward. I mean, it's it's almost impossible to. So the question at some point that we need to consider, uh, whether it's during the storm or after the storm, most of the time we're going to consider it after, is how can I find purpose in my pain? How do I I find purpose? If we don't at least at some level ask this question, we're going to just feel like everything's wasted. 
And all throughout the ancient scriptures, we come across the stories of individuals and families who had to endure storms of drama and distress and emotional suffering and just figure out how they're going to get through. And when you read their story, it's not like they're thanking God in the middle of it and say, God, thank you for my storm. No, they're saying, God, rescue me from this. I don't want to do this. But eventually they get through it and then they look back and they try to find purpose in it. And one of the stories that I want to anchor to today, um, uh, uh, one of the stories of, of pain that I am going to anchor to is uh, found for us in the book of 1 Samuel. And to give you a little bit of context, it takes place at a time where Israel is made up of a loose confederation of, of tribes. And the nation of Israel at this moment is adrift. It's kind of lost its focus. It's, it's not pursuing God, not staying faithful to God. And, and right at the start of the story, we're introduced to a family and, and more specifically an individual who's in the middle of an emotional storm. And the patriarch of the family is a guy named Elkanah. Here's what we read about Elkanah. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah did not. There's a lot packed in that verse, right? In ancient Jewish culture, polygamy was not forbidden, but it wasn't widely practiced. Uh, you had to be somewhat wealthy to afford a couple of wives. <laughs> Some of you know that with one wife, right? But you had to, you had to be somewhat wealthy. We assume uh, Elkanah was well off. He had two wives. And we learned throughout the story that there's tension. And there's problems between them, which surprises me. I can't imagine how having sister wives is going to create any kind of problem, but it does. And we don't read about this in the story, but Jewish tradition tells us that Elkanah and Hannah had been trying for kids for a decade. They still didn't have any. So Elkanah, like, he wants a baby mama. He wants to continue the family line. And so he goes after Penina and she starts having kids. And according to tradition, Penina had 10 children. So this is what the family picture looked like. You got Hannah, Elkanah, Penina, and her 10 kids. You think your family's dysfunctional? This is all over the map, right? And right at the start of the story, we learned that Elkanah was a godly man. Every year, he made it a practice to travel with his family from the small town in which they lived. And he traveled for 15 miles, which was about a day's journey. And he would travel to a small town of Shiloh where uh, the tabernacle was. Tabernacle is this portable tent of worship that uh, the Jewish people had before a temple was built. And so they would travel together as a family an entire day there, an entire day back. It's a lot of commitment. And while they would go to the, the tabernacle, they would bring an animal with them to sacrifice. The way it worked is the priest would take the animal, uh, they would burn it, they would sacrifice it, they would take a little portion and just say, hey, that really is reserved for God. So uh, it wasn't something the family got back. But then a, a, the, another portion of the animal was given back to the family for them to eat. And so Elkanah would split it up and he'd give it to uh, Penina and the 10 children they had together. But uh, uh, Hannah had a special place in his heart. And he knew that she was distraught and he knew that she was so broken up and constantly in an emotional storm because of, of being unable to have kids. And so he would actually give her more. And, and I love how the New International Version of the Bible explains it because it's really straightforward. Here's what we read. But to Hannah, when it comes to the meat from the animal, he gave a double portion. Why? Because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. Those words bother me. The Lord had closed her womb. He could have given her children, but he chose not to. He could have answered her prayer, but he didn't. Not having children created an emotional storm for Hannah because she's living at a time period and in a culture where having children is considered a sign of God's blessing. And if you're unable to have children, it must mean something's wrong with you. And so children are a sign of security. They're a sign of social status. So let's, let's go back to the family picture again. You can see how this creates a problem. Every day, Hannah sees Penina and her children. And there's growing resentment and there's anger. She loves God, but there's bitterness building up. Have you ever been in a storm where you're doing your best to be faithful to God and you're doing your best, you're staying engaged with your church family, you're watching online, you're showing up in person, you're part of your group, you're like, you're still serving and you're looking at someone who has no desire to ever serve God and it feels like they're getting all the blessing but you're getting all the curse. And so Hannah had this resentment inside of her and it just built during these annual trips to the tabernacle because the whole family would travel together and here's what we read. Penina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. So she's not just dealing with this issue. She's being mocked because of her issue. She's being harassed. The emotional storm is out of control. And at some point, 
Hannah had to ask the same question we all asked, like what good could possibly come out of this? And we don't need her story to ask that question because we all ask it from time to time, like what good can come out of this? Three and a half years ago, I officiated the wedding of some friends. Sharp, young, successful, good looking. Today, they're separated and disillusioned. Never imagine that within five years, their marriage would come to an end. And they're asking the question, what good could possibly come out of this? Not long ago, my wife, Randy, and I were invited to a baby shower, got the invitation in the mail. And then a few weeks later, that invitation was followed by the announcement of a miscarriage. As you can imagine, the couple was devastated and shocked. And I met with them in person and they literally asked the question with those words, what good could possibly come out of this? And I've learned not to answer that question. There are storms that we go through in life that seem to be worth enduring because we see the other side. We believe, we, you know, we, we believe something is going to come out of this. Even if we don't like it, at least we, we kind of have a sense of where this is headed. There are other storms that feel pointless. That's the one Hannah finds herself in. She's miserable. Her life isn't unfolding the way she envis- uh, envisioned. Every year she travels to the tabernacle and it becomes a source of pain for her. Here she's going there to worship. It is Jewish holiday. She's going to worship, but she feels pain here. Here's why. Year after year, it was the same. Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. It's a Jewish holiday. Hannah's supposed to be celebrating. She can't enjoy it. When you're in the middle of a storm, you've just come out of the storm, holidays can be difficult. You've been married for 45 years to the same person and now your spouse has passed away and this is your first holiday without them? Devastating. I see the prayer requests that come in to Timberlake Church and it feels like there's never a week where someone isn't asking for prayer to just get through the season because there's been some sort of loss of a loved one. When you have celebrated holidays with your family for 15 years. You've created lots of traditions, but now you've experienced a storm. Your family is split up. You're in a one bedroom apartment, just trying to get through the season on your own. What good could come out of this? Holidays are hard. They're overwhelming for lots of different reasons. But in this story, Penina is making it overly difficult because she's mocking Hannah, who's caught up in the emotional storm. And her husband sees her miserable. And it breaks his heart. He loves her. And so he asks her this question. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you don't have no children? Because you have no children. You have me. Isn't that better than having 10 sons? What a great lesson for every guy in how to talk to your wife. (laughs) Why are you so sad? You got me. Come on, baby. (laughs) There's the guy's trying. Wrong thing, wrong time, right? Now, nowhere in the, this story is the suffering of Hannah uh, like sugarcoated. Her emotional pain is described in detail. Nobody minimizes it. Nobody downplays it. You know, Elkanah tries to distract her from it. But here's what we read. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. She's in this emotional storm and she prays to the Lord. The same Lord who has allowed her to be in this situation. The same Lord who has chosen not to answer her prayer. This kind of thing messes with us, right? Because if God's good, if he's capable, if he's powerful, why would he ever allow a godly woman like Hannah to experience this? It makes sense if he's not good, if he's not capable, if he's not powerful. But if he is, why would he allow her to go? Why would he continue to bless Penina, who has 10 children? Why would he bless her? She's mocking Hannah. But he allows it. And for some people, this is a philosophical question. Why does a loving God allow this stuff to happen? But for most of us, it's a deep rooted issue. Like it is a problem inside of us. If God loves me, why is he allowing me to experience what I'm experiencing? 16 years ago today, I received the call that my brother Rick, who was serving in, as a Marine in Iraq, was killed. And I've alluded to this many times over the years at Timberlake. It's April 14th, 2008. And I realized people are going to die. It's the result of war. But I could not get the question out of my head. Like, if God could have kept him alive, why didn't he? 
Because Rick had a bunch of people back in the States praying for him, praying for his safety. There were a lot of people who had nobody praying for them and they survived. And he was killed by a roadside bomb. Several military vehicles in the convoy that Rick was in, several of the vehicles drove over the exact same area that Rick's Humvee did, but it just happened, his Humvee happened to uh, hit it in just the right way that the explosion went off. What if God is powerful and loving, but still allowed Rick to be killed? Can I trust a God who allows tragedy in my life? Can I trust a God who doesn't always make sense? So Hannah's story is a story of pain. But instead of running from the God who allowed that pain into her life, I'm not saying he caused it, but he certainly allowed it, right? And, and, and who knows, maybe he did cause it. I mean, it seemed like the Lord had closed up her womb, right? But instead of running from that God, she, she ran to him. She pours out her heart. Pouring out her heart to God does not mean we're praying these short, memorized, rehearsed, trite prayers. Pouring out our heart is, God, I don't get this. I don't understand this. I'm angry right now. I'm convinced that you either don't exist or if you do exist, you don't see what I'm going through or you don't care. I'm becoming cynical. I don't want to be cynical, but this is the situation I'm in. I pray and pray and pray. You don't answer my prayer, but look at them over there. You seem to be blessing them. Hannah's just pouring out her heart to God. In the midst of her pouring out her heart, she makes a vow. She says, oh Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. I'm glad that in prayer, our parents didn't commit us to something for our entire life, right? But in prayer, she in anguish, she says, Lord, he's yours. We're giving him back to you. You bless me with a child, I'm gonna bless him, bless you by, by giving him back. Now, obviously, not all stories end happily ever after. I don't want to suggest that in any way, but God does answer Hannah's prayer. Nine months later, she gives birth to a son. His name is Samuel, which means God has heard. And when Samuel is three or four years old, his parents bring him along with them to this annual trip to the tabernacle. And they get to the tabernacle and they ask for the, high, or for, or ask for the priest and he comes out and they explain we committed that if God answered our prayer and gave us a child, we would surrender him to the Lord. So we want to leave him here at the tabernacle to be trained for full-time ministry and leadership. They leave him there. And I just want to pause and say, don't ever do that with me. <laughs> I don't care if they're potty trained. Do not leave your toddler with me and say, hey, we're just praying for ministry, right? And here's what we read. But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. So he starts being trained and prepared for, for ministry and leadership. And, and people would go to the tabernacle and they'd see this five-year-old kid, this six-year-old, seven-year-old kid just running around with this little priest garment. And everybody would be like, who's that? And the answer would be, well, that's Samuel. That's Hannah's son. The, the son that was born to her during the time of an emotional storm. The, the son that was born to her out of pain and out of heartache and out of anguish. And she surrendered her son to the Lord. So now he's being trained for, for ministry. And every time that his parents would come and visit, they, they noticed that Samuel's becoming more and more mature. We read, meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord and with the people. Now, that sounds like the end of the story, but it's actually the beginning. This is only chapter two in the Story of Samuel continues to unfold until chapter 25. He goes from being a boy to a man and he uses his adult male voice to call on the people of Israel, to call on these various tribes, to surrender their idols, to eliminate, to destroy them and to turn their hearts back to God. Samuel's Hannah's son, a son born after a long emotional storm, a son born after a season filled with exhaustion and pain and harassment and misery. And eventually Samuel is an elderly man and he senses God leading him to identify and call out the, the next king of Israel. Currently Saul is the king and he senses God lead him to a young man by the name of David. And Samuel, Hannah's son, takes oil and pours it over the head of David and anoints him as the second king of Israel. A son, Samuel, was born out of emotional pain. And I do not tell you this story to, to try to resolve whatever internal conflict you may have during or after a storm. 
I don't tell you this story to suggest that we're ever gonna understand the mysteries of God, that everything ends with a bow on top of the package. What I am trying to communicate is this, often our all-knowing, all-powerful and ever-present God chooses to bring unspeakable good out of unspeakable pain. This does not mean that everything turns out the way we're hoping or praying or that it turns out better. It does mean that God is able to take the ashes of our life and make something meaningful from them. He's able to take the debris left from the storm and do something with them. After Hurricane Katrina hit back in 2005, there were artists who came along and they took some of the debris and they made an entire art collection from the debris. They said, we're gonna try to create beauty out of disaster. And that is what God does with our lives. He, over time, takes the debris of the storm and makes something from it. The Apostle Paul tries to give his readers hope in the first century when he writes to them and he says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. He doesn't say everything's good. He says God can cause things to work together for good. And Hannah's story is not an isolated story. The story after story after story after story in the scripture, we are reminded that life is filled with difficulty and pain and loss and betrayal. But in the aftermath of every storm, with the debris that's left, God finds a way to use it for the good. God can take the divorce. He can take the loss. He can take the anguish you've been through and do something with it. That's the hopeful news. The discouraging news is often we find purpose after the storm. During the storm, it's just so hard to see, so hard to think. Our emotions are just all over the map. In weather-related storms, like the perfect storm that unfolded back in 91, after the storm, meteorologists are able to learn more about weather patterns. They're able to predict better. I mean, they learn through every storm that ever happens, like, hey, here's, here's something we can do. And so we, if it's nothing else, we learn from storms. Uh, sometimes storms reset the environment. And in life storms, there is purpose. And I'm not saying this to make you feel good. Let me, I'm just gonna give you a real life example. So I received this call that my brother Rick had been killed. And as you can imagine, it was the start of the most painful, most excruciating, gut-wrenching storm I'd ever experienced. I was miserable, I was heartbroken. I went back to speak at his funeral. In the aftermath of that loss, there was a growing restlessness inside of me. I was 33 years old, my brother Rick was 23, and I had had a dream inside of me and Rick had shared this dream. Someday I wanted to start a church. And so we would talk about it, and, but now I'm 33 years old and I'm thinking, man, I don't know how long I have on this planet. And so four months after Rick was killed, I, uh, some, some friends of mine and myself, we packed up a moving truck and, uh, and then I drove my family across the country in went back to my hometown, Kenosha, Wisconsin, and, and started Great Lakes Church. And several of Rick's friends, they didn't even hide why they were helping. They said, we wanna be a part of this because it's, we feel like it's a way of honoring Rick. And so we launched a church. That was 15 years ago. And over the last 15 years that I was with them, and the church grew. We baptized over a thousand people during that time period. Thousands of lives were impacted. To this day, that church is going strong and they're making a difference. God used tragedy. God used loss and he brought something good from it. Now, if you're new to Timberlake, you may not realize this. I've only been here for five months as the lead pastor. Prior to that, I would come as a guest speaker. So I've been here for five months. But I tell you that story because every once in a while, as we look back on our lives, I think we're given a glimpse of how God is at work through tragic events and situations. Even when it seems like God is absent. I don't believe that God caused Rick's death but I do believe he, he used it. And we may not always see the good that comes from the aftermath of a storm, but I assure you good is happening. Even if it's, we're being drawn closer to God, we're becoming more dependent on God. God, who is just kind of this figure out there somewhere in the universe, right? All of a sudden becomes personal. And if you're in the middle of a storm today, I know it seems hopeless at times, and I know it feels like the storm is never gonna end, but let me remind you, every storm eventually ends. Every single storm that has hit this planet, no matter how fierce, no matter how devastating, no matter how many homes were destroyed, no matter how many people died in it, at some point, the storm subsided and came to an end. 
Now, I alluded to this last week. There are some storms, I think, like mental health storms that they come and then they go and then they come back again. It just feels like our entire life we battle them. Yeah, that's, that's fair. There are going to be some storms that they come and go through our entire life. And there are certain storms when you're in the middle of them, you're just convinced this is never, ever going to end. But I'm telling you, you're wrong. It does end. It may come back again. I'm not saying it never will, but you will get relief. Now that reality is often seen through the lens of time, but my hope is that when heartache crashes into our life and the storms come on strong, that you and I can reflect the same kind of heart and attitude that the apostle Paul seemed to reflect after he went through storms. And I don't think his attitude was always like this. I'm guessing that there were probably multiple events in his life that just kept building up his faith, building up his faith, building up his faith. But he goes through one storm and he doesn't tell us what it is. It could have been a literal physical storm, could have been an emotional storm, could have been a relationship storm, could have been something with his health. But here's what he writes. He says, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we were expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God. In other words, good was coming out of it. What kind of God? The God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. If you're in a storm, I'm telling you, that storm will eventually come to an end and good can come out of that storm. Throughout history, God has proven himself to be faithful. God has proven himself to be able to connect the dots. God has proven himself to be a good, good father. Doesn't mean everything is good, but he's proven that he is a good father. So can you get to a point where you trust that our wildly mysterious God is able to bring unspeakable good out of unspeakable pain? Now, I'm gonna pray for us in just a moment. Before I do that, I wanna invite you, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, to do so today. And to surrender our life to Jesus simply means I'm stepping off the throne of my life and I'm inviting Jesus onto the throne. I recognize that I'm not the best leader for my life. More than that, I recognize I'm a sinner. I'm broken. There's things inside of me that I, I don't want to believe are inside of me. And sometimes I don't even see them until a storm comes and then the emotions are coming. I'm, whatever God's standards are, I'm going to fall short. I don't even measure up to my own standards sometimes. So therefore, I'm not putting my faith and my hope and my trust in myself. I'm putting it in Jesus. And so I step off the throne and I invite Jesus onto it. I want to know that when I go through a storm again, that I have a connection to God and that I can be assured he's with me in the middle of that storm. So in this final prayer, if you, if you want to surrender your life to Jesus, and I invite you to do so, just in your heart, just say, today I, I surrender. I want to become a follower of Jesus. And then in the coming weeks and months, just keep joining us. We, we talk all the time about what it looks like to follow Jesus. Because to follow Jesus says, when I become aware of what God wants me to do, I'm going to do it. And sometimes I'm going to fail. And sometimes it's going to be three steps forward and four steps backwards. But at the end of the day, I still believe he's a better leader for my life than I am. And so I go from this direction to following him. And then if you make that decision, what we are going to ask is that you put it on your connection card. You find a connection card, you put it on, you can swing by our next steps table. We'll have connection cards back there. But every service today, people have, have gone by and taken one of these boxes. This is for people who say, hey, I'm making a first time decision to follow Jesus. We have these boxes available filled with some resources to get you started on your spiritual journey. We wanna be a part of that. We wanna be a blessing to you. We'd go ahead and stand and then I'm going to pray and close our service. Heavenly Father, we thank you that throughout history, we can look back and we can see your goodness and your faithfulness and your mercy and your love and compassion. That even when we screw up our lives, even when we make decisions that create storms, that by your grace, we can get through those storms. I pray today for those who for the first time are surrendering their lives to you. They're stepping off the throne of their life. They're inviting you onto it. They acknowledge brokenness, sinfulness, and acknowledge their need for a savior. And today they simply are surrendering themselves to you. I pray today would be a marked day. That whether it's a month from now, a year from now, or five years from now, as they go through storms, they would know you are with them in the storm that they're going through because they've surrendered their life to you. And God, I pray all over this room, the different storms represented, storms of loss, storms related to career, storms related to relationships, mental health storms, emotional storms. Lord, all of the storms represented, 
You are a God who is greater than the storm. You're a God who is more powerful than the storm. And we ask for your strength. We ask for the spirit of God to come alive inside of us in such a way that we're able to get through to the other side and that you would give us the ability to look back and find good that came out of a storm that we wanted nothing to do with. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being here today. We are done being the church in here. Now let's go be the church out there. We'll see you.